Welcome to the CG Pro Podcast. This is episode 67. And today we have with us Devin Mathis, who I'm going to introduce in just a second. If you enjoy today, you can follow us at becomecgpro.com uh, or join our free Facebook group. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Devin today. Devin is a lighting supervisor and works a lot in the world of virtual production. He's currently at Sony Pictures Torchlight. Devin, welcome. Great to have you here. Thanks for having me, dude. It's great to be here. You bet. Yeah, it's great. Great to have you here. And I'm excited to hear about what you can talk about today. And uh, uh, but first, I'd love to just hear a little bit about how how you got here. How did you especially love hearing about kind of early any early inspirations you had? Is this something you always wanted to get into? Did you stumble into it? What, what was your your path here? Actually stumbled into it. That's such a fun question. So it, I got my very first 3D job in Dallas as an intern at a, at a, at like a health facility. And we were working in Unreal Engine for children and young adults on the autism spectrum to help them normalize themselves with like how to interact with people and how to understand communication and stuff, right? And it was all in VR and that's where I started. Wow. And then I got a call from Magnopus in LA, I was like 2017. And I joined up with those guys. And it was in those days, early VR stuff, a um, little bit of virtual production because they were starting the Lion King back then, or they were wrapping up the Lion King back then. Um, yeah. But it was a lot of VR yeah. stuff for me to start. I was an environment artist. And then I don't know, 20, 18 ish you know one of my producers was like hey Devin, we're going to be doing some more virtual production stuff and i didn't know what that was and they're like but like you you led the art team for this one vr project for disney called myth you want to lead the virtual production department and i'm like sure that <laughs> i don't know what that is and it was crazy because like you know magnopus was is run by uh, a, a lot of really great people but ben grossman and alex hinning uh, Oscar winners, right? And so they have a lot of connections with Hollywood. So I never once thought I'd be working in movies or anything like that. I just happened to be like a lighter in Unreal Engine, uh, some Unity stuff, environment artist. And then all of a sudden we're working with like all, all of these filmmakers for people that like I grew up watching all the time. And it was just insane to me. And it was that guy, that producer completely, completely changed my life. Like I got definitely bit by the film bug and I've been chasing that high ever since, man, every day. So yeah, I'm a cinematographer now and I'm a lighting supervisor over at Torchlight and uh, life has been really, really rewarding and really exciting, especially like in this new space of like virtual content, virtual worlds, right? And like religion stuff clashing with traditional filmmaking and how did those two come together? Yeah, we're still working that one out <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah, That's super cool. Yeah. So before before that, before the that amazing job and a really really cool per, definite personal connection to the to autism, the autism community. Um, mm -hmm. But the um, before that, how did you get? How did you get to that point? Did you did you study for this? Did you do a, a degree or anything? How did, how did you get? Yeah. To that? yeah. So I was at the University of Texas at Dallas, and I think they've had this program. I think it was either the I think it was the second year of this program. It's called Arts and Technology as their major at University of Texas at Dallas. It's in Richardson, right outside Dallas. And um, I, I, when I got to college, you know, before college, I was like one person. And I got to college, and it was like a little switch flipped, and I was just head to the grindstone, always working and doing stuff. So. Um, what I think school taught me a whole lot when I was still there was that, uh, how to rely and how to teach myself, because a lot of the content that I was being taught at the time, it was like 2015, 2016, wasn't necessarily exactly what I needed to like a, a technical level. This is like when substance two came out, right? Substance designer two, uh, yep. or one, or I can't remember what it was. And I'm, I'm trying to pick up and learn all these things that I can and I'm and I'm showing it all my other classmates and we're working hard together on projects and stuff. And I got that internship because one of those days we're all in the lab, but every desk was taken. And I saw one of these guys come in. He's like looking for a spot, you know, 
and he's about to leave. And I was like, no, 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 here, come sit with me. So we worked together and me just doing that for him. He's like, Hey, you know, I work at this place and we could use another intern. Would you like to come join up with us? And that's, that's how I started my whole journey was just being nice. That's an important quality for sure. And that's something mm -hmm. that uh, always tell people to get be, become as good as you possibly can, but also to, to stay humble and, and be nice to people. It's not, not everybody does that as they get really good at something. So it's very, very crucial. Um, mm -hmm. and really good to, good to hear that, um, mm -hmm. that validation on, on that topic. What, um, what was your major? What did you, what were you studying? So it was literally called arts and technology, but within arts and technology, you know, you're able this was at the time, I don't know if it's changed now, but at the time, you know, you're able to put a focus on exactly what it is you wanted to do. So then it was, it was environment art. And that's what I was doing a lot of 3d environment art, environmental storytelling. Um, so a lot of unreal, a lot of ZBrush, a lot of Maya, um, substance painter and designer had just come out. So I was really, really pushing a designer and doing all kinds of really crazy, like tileable materials. I mean, crazy for back when that came out. Now people are like doing insane things, but like I looked up to a lot of cool people early then, like uh, Javier Perez and uh, what's his name? Something Olwen. He used to work at Naughty Dog, but I don't know if he's there anymore. But I looked up to a lot of these guys on ArtStation because I would always look at ArtStation every day to see where is the bar? Like what? Do, how good do I need to be to get up to this point? So I was always looking for like, where do I need to go? How good do I need to to push my skills far enough to get to this point. And that was always, at least that was always a driving force for me, like every day looking on ArtStation, seeing what everyone's doing. That's cool. Yeah, it's great, great to get inspired mm. by things like that. And at the beginning of my 3D career, it was a lot of CG Society, which uh, was a yeah. very beloved site. Um, and it, it kind of did, did both those, in both inspiration and also um, put some fear in me as well, like thinking, <laughs> How am I going to get, how am I going to get to be that good? But uh, right. not, a little bit of that's not so bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to so get pushed, you know, what, what, um, what tools did you, you, um, in your, in your first job that you mentioned, um, yeah. were you mostly using unreal? Were you using a mix of different things? That job I got, I got that internship and what, what really, what they liked about my portfolio at the time was that I was doing a lot of very modular, like, like kits of things, which also included substance designer making really good tileable materials in like, like technical trim sheets, you know, how you'd like correctly space them so many pixels apart so that it UVs correctly. So at the time, like, I remember looking at the GDC paper for sunset overdrive back then when that was when that was they had written their paper on how they did trim sheets. And how they did like the auto normals for like edges and things like that and auto damage and things. So I was doing a lot of substance designer, doing a lot of Maya for sure. Um, sometimes ZBrush. I would always try to challenge myself to like try to do as much like texturing stuff as I could, even if it was considered sculpting, and try to do as much as I could in designer, right? And to not leave it because like I could go back to ZBrush because um, like the, the Sony Santa Monica team, the God of War team, they're some of the best sculptors on the planet. And I would always look to their work back then to think, how can I do what they're doing by hand, but procedurally back in my textures? Right, so that's yeah. about, and then Unreal Engine, of course. All of our stuff was in Unreal Engine. Uh, oh. Unreal Engine 4 back then. I don't remember yeah. the, the exact version, though. Remember Unreal 4, or Unreal 4, even 3. Good. Uh, oh, UDK? Version's been good. Were you on UDK? I was never on UDK. Yeah. A long time ago, not, not like seriously, just a little, a little oh, okay, okay. Um, but really got into it seriously in properly in four, um, when I started mm -hmm. doing some professional work in it, uh, in various different forms in sort of theme park entertainment in the beginning, um, oh, just cool. as an offshoot from a break from movies, I guess. Mm -hmm. What, um, so, so as we're talking about tools, what, um, how have you seen the tools evolve? over the over the years you've been involved in them um i was really really excited early on because they 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 uh magnopus even my internship they really liked this like technical approach that i i took to environment art stuff right and there was always like a new tool coming out or a new feature in unreal or substance or whatever 
and I would like latch onto that new thing and I would really, really push for it and do things to it. So I remember like, you know, having to really, really, uh, be careful with my UV placement and textile densities back then. Right. And then tools came out to make that easier. And I remember having to worry about like the squashing and stretching of textures or being pixel accurate. Um, then there's, and your light map UVs in the same way for those. And what else dude? Like, Oh, and in unreal engine, like when you had to like, and you probably still do to an extent, um, making sure like in unreal that like your light map, like density is across everything is like going good. But like, there's so many either tools now or just built in features where you don't necessarily have to think about them the way that we used to. And I keep in my heart, I keep wanting to say back then, but back then wasn't that long ago. Like it changes so quick, right? It's, and I used to feel this way about like, wow, okay, cool. I'll learn this new thing. And then I'm going to be really, really useful. And I'll learn this thing. And then a year later or less than a year later, a tool would come out or a plugin would come out and it would just be like, boop, like done. And I'm like, man. So at some point in my career, I shifted away from thinking about chasing the tool and chasing the tech and put and putting more into being creative. Right? Like if you, if you look at, you know, Steven Spielberg, that guy's not in Unreal Engine learning how to do light map UVs, right? He's a great storyteller. Talking about UVs, yeah. But in, <laughs> right. in Unreal Engine in a different way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he's, I don't, you know, at least from what I know, I don't think he's the most technically inclined, like doing all the, the hard technical stuff. He's a great, amazing, fantastic storyteller. And so somewhere along my career, at the spectrum of being completely technical and completely creative, I used to be over here into te more technical. Now I've been shifting more over here. And a lot of the tools coming out nowadays make that stuff easier. Like I've become, at least to me, like self-validated when you see things like if you're in Photoshop and you just want to, when I, when I wanted to make a mask of something back then, I would have to like make a mask of my sky or the person in the thing. Yeah. Now you can just hand. like tell Photoshop, Hey, just make a mask for the sky. And then, and it's like, it's so crazy, which is great. Cause it, it, it gets rid of like this technology requirement, knowledge requirement, and it gets it out of the way just so you can focus on being creative, which is ultimately like what we're here for, right? Like we're, we consume either games or television or movies for the entertainment factor of like this incredible story that's in front of us and removing a lot of these barriers gives more time to be creative. So in, in describing how you've <clears throat> taken less emphasis, taken emphasis off the, the tool itself, because as you said, they change a lot. Um, what, what do you focus on in terms of uh, de creative developing your creative chops, I guess, if, if it's more the fundamentals mm. that you're focused on now, what, what's the things you do to help develop that? There are some really, really big things. I had a, I had a mentor back at Magnopus and, uh, he taught me quite a lot and changed my entire view and practices of how I approach this, this stuff. So for a long time, you know, I had been like a photographer and I'd like, like taking pictures and I say photographer, right. Cause I just did it for fun. And I just, I have a Sony camera, I had a Sony camera before Sony. So this is not a shameless plug. Um, uh, but make I was a, it's fair enough. <laughs> their cameras are nice. It was a stills camera and, you know, I live in LA, so there's lots of pretty things to, you know, point and shoot. So I'd go around LA sometimes just for fun, take pictures. And then I started to realize, you know, my job as a lighter. I was, as I was taking photographs, I'm like, hmm, this is so interesting. Like, look at how the light hits the Griffith Observatory like this. Or I would remember, you know, in winter, I know where the sun rises when I'm at the observatory because I go there quite often. Um, I know where the sun rises when it's winter and I know where it rises when it's summer. And I know what that light looks like whenever there are these big mountains. And I know what it looks like when the sun creeps over the mountain and it creates this super sharp, light that cuts through and then right as it peaks up the light just explodes in the sky right and so a lot of me just observing really really observing what i'm doing and doing photography because now i do it very seriously so now i've done like a lot of architectural photos i do a lot of photos on set 
I'm a cinematographer on set. So all this stuff has come in handy for me now. Um, but just observing things is like so big because you, it's so easy to miss the fine details of things, right? It's very, very easy to miss it. You have to really look for it. It's the same thing like when I watch movies, when I watch movies and I'm watching what Greg, Greg Frazier is doing, right? If I'm trying to like pick his brain of like, if I can't hang out with the guy, then I can at least watch, look at his work and be like, how did Greg do this? You know, I'll watch it first for fun, just for the entertainment factor. And then the second and the third time I'll watch it and just really pick apart, like, how did Greg get this shot? Or how did Greg light this thing? Or, or we were just talking about Oppenheimer before this started, you know, how did, how did Hoyt like really get this going? Like, how did he achieve this look? Same on Ad Astra. Ad Astra, beautiful film by Hoyt as well. And El Conde, that cinematographer, they've had so much fun, but really just like I would go on art station and be like, where are people, what are people doing right now? That for me is like, now it's movies. Uh, whereas, as I just said earlier, like I never thought I'd be working in movies, but now I'm like looking at the greats, you know, Roger Deakins and everybody thinking, how can I achieve some of this? And so I take a lot of that, that I do on set or on my own personal time. And how do I bring that back into Unreal Engine to make things a lot more cinematic, you know? a lot to, to aid in the story of what's going on. So how do you, how do you do that? So I think what's really important is to like, when I would look at images as an environment artist, I would always break down. Uh, if I wanted to like study someone's work, I'd always break down. What are the major shapes in this image, right? Break this down into the simplest forms from a 3D modeling perspective when I when I did that stuff. Um, and from there, I'd piece myself back to like, oh, okay, I understand now kind of how you, 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 you put these big shapes in the foreground and you kind of push these things off in the background and it makes a really nice composed image. Um, nowadays, it's, it's a, sa a very similar idea, but for lighting. So for lighting, I'm either looking at photography or I'm looking at paintings. Um, I wish LA had its own Met. I know we have the Hammer Museum, and we have a, a few a few others, but the Met is so beautiful. But just looking at these pieces of art and really breaking down fundamentally, like what is the key light inside of this scene right now? What is the big source? And if you don't have that big key, like like for me, you see like here, like it's going across my face, right? Because I got a big window right here. And I placed myself on this couch for a reason so that it would look nice. And you can see I have a gradation of light coming this way. So this image is no longer like a flat image. And my face isn't flat, right? So you can study images and just break it down to fundamentals. What is the, the key light, which is very important, every shot, figure out what that's going to be. And then what are going to be like some nice rim lights or top lights, like for my hair? Like, I don't know if this camera actually picks it up, but like getting light off the shoulder, getting light, toppy light up here, or especially like on these back shoulders, how can we, how can we get that in Unreal Engine or on set? Like it doesn't matter. Or painting it, whatever. Like lighting is lighting, and these are all just tools. Uh, the brush, the gaffer who's hanging up all the lights, the Unreal lighting artist. These are all just tools, right? So I don't necessarily put a heavy emphasis on like the tool at hand. I'm fairly agnostic as to whatever the tool is, but understanding lighting is what I think is incredibly important. And then how do you communicate that? that that's also incredibly important. Yeah, what, um, so you mentioned looking at other people's work. Is there a, a kind of way that you like to break it down? Do you, do you get in touch with people and, and ask them questions about it? Do you look at shot, shot decks is always a good uh, resource? Shot deck's great. Yeah. No, yeah, I love shot deck. Yeah, I, I love talking with people. As you can tell, if if no one here stops me from talking, I'll just keep talking. But uh, I love shot deck, and I love talking with with other cinematographers. Um, and I love like the the uh, the director for American Beauty. I remember in, in a in a Deacon's podcast, he talked about how his whole background was all theater, right? And then American Beauty is like either one of the first things or the first things that he ever got to direct. And when he got there, he's asking everybody all these like silly questions, right? And he's like, hey, so how does this camera work? Like, how do you turn it on? And they're like, what do you mean? How do you turn it on? And they, they're asking, he's asking all these super basic questions. And I think even recently there was an article about Sydney Sweeney, like going around and just 
wanting to learn and there's no pride, there's no ego. It's full humility to just kind of learn the craft. So I love reaching out to people and being like, hey, this piece of work that you did, this is really cool. Can we have coffee and hang out and chat about it or something? Um, or, um, oh no, I lost my train of thought. What were we just talking about? Well, just uh, uh, your process, I guess, uh, or, or just some of the things that you do to to try and understand what, what makes good lighting. Because I think it's something that, that I definitely ran into at the beginning of my career yes. as a software yeah. engineer. You know, got stumbling into the world of intentionally stumbling into the world of mm -hmm. visual effects. Um, but I, I was very used to writing code, and I wasn't very used to lighting scenes. And I, you know, I got some very, um, let's say, helpful feedback at the beginning in terms of where I was not showing up in terms of understanding lighting. So I had some some good mentoring there. But yeah, you know, just curious about how you uh, how you approach um the the because it's a continual thing i know it's not just something that you study once and then you've got it oh like dude how, yeah how you um how you continue to to kind of understand lighting or or break it down or seek guidance i think at first because my background was more technical i would break it down technically like i talked about the foundations of like all this stuff kind of around me and then when my understanding of like the technicalities was like like good to go I started to to look more into well how does this image make me feel you know colors and value shifting you know like being so like front lit versus silhouetted or like light coming from here or like here these things all make you feel a certain way or at least i feel like they do and colors make you feel a certain way you know if we're talking about like the ending to jurassic park when the t-rex kill or gets all the velociraptors and it does his big roar or she does her big roar and uh uh that's like the cool hero hero shot at the end of the movie right and that was lit like very like heroic and valiantly inside that room but like what would how would you feel if like there was just like one light on what if it was just like one big top light and maybe it doesn't feel like that anymore and I feel like once I got past this, like, I call it technical. I don't know what other word to call it. This like technical barrier of like, yeah, you need a key light and you need a, 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 a rim and you need a fill. Like you need those things. I think putting it to, to practice in any way that I could, any way, whether it's observing or I'm in Unreal Engine and I'm just like taking environments that I've already made and like I just do over them again, or I download environments off the marketplace or or whatever like I, I go get my camera on my phone and i just go i try and do this with a lampshade or something um doing it over and over in different styles started to click in my head it was like a little light bulb went off or i could finally see the matrix or something it was i think once you can get to that point of of like understanding how this makes you feel will really really that's a big separator i feel like there are things that look cool right? I'm like, oh, that looks kind of cool. But there's, there's not many things that like, this makes me feel sad. And I don't know why this makes me feel sad. Or this is like spooky. Like, this is, I don't know, like, well, how are they making this feel spooky? And then I'll study like how they did that, right? And that's a great way too to like, mimicking people like when, when, when painters go to the loo to like, and just paint all these masterful paintings, they're just doing it themselves, right? And it's not that they're like trying to copy these people, but they're practicing, like getting as close as they can to all these different paintings on a wall. I f in my opinion, a lighter or cinematographer should be doing as much of that as they can as well, through any means, whatever it is on your phone, observing, Photoshop, Unreal Engine. Unreal Engine is a good one because it's free, right? There's lots of free stuff. So you can download any number of environments and relight them in different ways and just take a look. That's great, great advice. Yeah, really interesting to hear your your take on it. You know how you how you observe it really it being the what art artistry is is observing, right? It's observing the world and then maybe trying to reproduce it in some way or create something new out of things that you've seen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, so it sounds like you're um, taking inspiration from other people's work, you're observing the real world, you're being conscious about it, you're, you're, mm -hmm. if I can try and summarize your, what you said is, is being, being conscious of what you're seeing, 
and understanding hundred percent how that's making you feel and then really being aware of that that's what drives it yeah and if you see like if you watch a movie one of the, like just as they will copy paintings they'll try to paint and match what they're seeing if you can do the same thing with a with this like if you go on shot deck and just pull up like you know two people in a wide frame or something right and just try to replicate that with basic shapes back in unreal engine try and match that lighting back in unreal as like a quick one hour study right and just it'll help you understand like oh so i thought it was this way but it's not this way and then like you'll learn very quick it's no different than these guys when they paint you know uh lighting is the same way like you you really should put it to practice and and like mimicking work and trying to match something like a still from shot deck which i use all the time i don't work at shot deck by the way but it's a great it's a great website i love it um uh that's a so that's like a rocket ship to getting better. It's just looking at great work, try to match it. Right. Yeah, you know, being having that experiential exercise driven approach mm -hmm. to it rather than just reading. There's there's um some good stats around that that I've read in the past around how much you retain based on what you read or what you see or what you hear mm -hmm. being less so um than interactive work and in something you're actually practicing and trying it's a, lot, a lot of what we do at the school are really uh, practically driven for that for that reason so you, you you learn more of what you do right yep yep and then you can speak to it you know what i mean it's like one thing to read it from a book and then recite that knowledge but it's another thing to do the work and then explain it so can you tell us a little bit about what you, what your job looks like at the moment what what do you you don't have to give me all the details about fallout that you can't tell me but um yeah but, uh what 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 is what what do you spend your time doing as a, a lighting supervisor so now you know I'm a, i've been at sony pictures at a new department called torchlight right run the lighting supervisor at so we're working with directors that are very early on in the process of their movie making and it might even be that they need to get a thing greenlit and so at the moment, a lot of what I'm doing is working with directors and sometimes there's a cinematographer attached. So we'll work with both of them and we'll figure out like, hey, so what is like, what is the, the, the mood and the tone and the atmosphere of like of this story? What are these big emotional beats during the script that um, should make us feel a certain way? You know, I'm always asking directors, you know, hey, so in the script, um, what what is the lighting called for in the script and what i mean by that is like what is the uh, what is the emotional state of what's going on in the script you know oh well right now these two people they're really fighting or these two people they're asleep right you're like okay okay and then how like how should how do you think we should be feeling you know and all of those questions about emotions and feeling like all of those esoteric things I try to bring them back and then I'll do big broad stroke lighting back inside of Unreal. And we'll be like, hey, do you mean like you want something like this? And like, that's exactly it. Um, but here are some notes and get back to me in like two weeks. You know, we're in Unreal. So a lot of these filmmakers, they're not working in Unreal. So they don't know how fast real time is. So I'll be like, oh, hang on. We can, we can do it like right here. Here, what are your notes? Just let me know. And then like, we'll start doing the notes and they'll be like, Oh my God, this is this is so fast, you know, because I'll loom in and, and all that stuff inside of Unreal, right? So we're doing big broad strokes either in Unreal or I'm doing a bunch of like light paintings in Photoshop um, where they'll give us some ideas about what they're looking for. And we'll come up with like um, uh, color keys or mood boards or in Unreal, a whole 3D scene that's like lit like pretty pretty quick like we're we're moving very fast so it's not like we're we're baking lights right now we're not doing that stuff anymore because we're moving too quickly and we have a big emphasis on being fluid and flexible um and so that's where we are right now sometimes they take me from the beginning of a project and they put me right in the middle of one so sometimes we're doing like we need to go on set to do something whether they need someone to help out being like uh an ac on something or just to hang out with the dp to like help, you know, navigate, you know, virtual production and an LED volume or something, right? I've done a number of those in my past. We did Westworld and Fallout. And so they'll bring me on to hang out with DPs to help explain like, all right, cool. So here's our wall. And then here's like what it's doing. Here's what you and your gaffer are doing. Let's work together 
to make a super blended set like what like it's married together and that blending like that marrying of an led set is really tricky and it's really tough and in my opinion that's kind of what makes or break an led volume scene like if you can tell that it's an led volume so they'll send me into these places to help to help uh, eliminate that feeling from an audience perspective so sometimes it's at the start sometimes in the middle and we haven't done things near the end yet, but I wouldn't be surprised with the way that we're moving right now at Torchlight. So you, when you're in Unreal, are you doing kind of previs or tech viz or final mm. imagery? Like what, what kind of states are the production in? We do what we call like, cause when you, when we're working with filmmakers, traditional filmmakers, they have worked with previs for a lot of their career, right? And to them, previs is like uh, gray, blocky, or very low polygon, roughed out models that just look like whatever. Um, and sometimes directors don't even use them. Like they just they just have them, and then they just throw them away, and they just do whatever they want to do. Um, but with what we have at Torchlight, we understand that. And so what we're trying to ha offer is like like advanced visualization, where uh, everybody that I work with, you know, we all come from a different sector within movie making industry stuff, right? And so that's great because we have lots of perspectives and opinions on how to make the same thing. So we're not stuck in a bubble of like, it should be done this way because it's always been done this way. So we put a lot of emphasis on being fast and flexible. So we offer heightened visualization where it looks 10 times better than what previs typical previs would would normally offer you we make it in like less than half the time it takes us like a lot of our projects we'll spend a week or two getting just like the big breath of it all in there but it looks like you've spent like months on this thing we've gone so quick and so far with this but that's great because it offers other department heads a chance to come in and ask questions because it's in such a state that the cinematographer can ask, oh, this is really cool. So like, but I was really hoping it could be sunset. And you're like, okay, cool. Let's just make it sunset. And they're like, oh my gosh, like what else could we learn? The director might ask, well, I'd really like to do like, you know, a fight scene and I'd like for these two guys to be doing this. And they're like, all right, cool. So at Torchlight, you know, we have full motion capture suits. We do all the motion capture in our little room and we put it back into Unreal within a few hours. And then we're like, we're ready to go with whatever blocking the director wants to do or the production designer. If they have blueprints, right? Tech biz that of a set they're going to build somewhere else, we can quickly visualize it before they build it, have the director come to Torchlight and, and, you know, we have a, a lot of cinematography equipment in our room that talks one-to-one -one with Unreal. So they'll pick up this like camera equipment and as they pick it up, the camera in Unreal moves with you. So they can really film their movie inside of our space. It tracks you everywhere you go. It tracks you back in Unreal. So I can build that production designer set. The director can shoot his shots in there. We might learn that, you know what? I'm going to have a guy flying through this window, but the window's too small. We need to make that window bigger. Also, this like pillar, it's just too big. It's kind of in the way. Let's get rid of this thing and let's do some more stuff over here. Then we can give that back to the production designer they can edit that blueprint before they've built it still. And then, you know, when they get all the notes and directors like, this is fantastic. This is great. Then you can start to build stuff. So I like to say that we have two big spheres of influence at Torchlight. One of them is pure creativeness. What is the, the, the mood and the look and the tone of this movie? How should it look and feel uh, across the board? And then the other sphere of influence is like the practicality, the production side of it, the nuts and bolts. How are we going to actually get this done? So we do a lot of, uh, we, technically it's pre but we like to call it advanced visualization and a whole lot of tech viz. And are you, are you using assets as they, as they're being developed for final for like, do, do you, do you do any like final stuff in the engine or does it move out into other software and other renderers? We're, we're looking to do final. Um, cause like we just, we just announced ourselves in January and then we all just started, you know, just less than a year ago. So we're looking to get to final, but what we do in the meantime is we can get it pretty 
freaking close to final. We can get 85% of the way there, but you know, that last 15% takes the longest, right? Cause that's the like polishing of like making this thing perfect. Um, but we set up our whole pipeline so that even though we work in unreal, we understand visual effects might not work in unreal. And so, um, we prepare all of our stuff so that we can it, remember how I talked about earlier, previous, it just gets thrown away. So we prepare it so that it's not thrown away. Visual effects can take what we have and keep it going because it's, it's at such a quality that it runs well in unreal and it works well for visual effects. And so using the same assets essentially that you use in, in that mode in doing visualization, mm -hmm. and those exact same assets and, moving further down the pipe, maybe into some other tools and into render man or Maya or Houdini or something. Yeah. We start, you know, modeling things either in Maya or ZBrush, um, or we, or we just have like a library of things already that exist. So we can just move even quicker, but we try and stick inside of unreal as much as we can for, I'm for so many things, dude. Like we we're always in unreal. That's 98% of our time is in unreal. That's cool. Yeah, really, really cool to hear that. Because you can do so much in there now. Like you can model, you can UV now with 5.3. And now with Embergen and Liquigen, that stuff's really dope. I know it's outside of Unreal, but you yeah. can bring that stuff back in. And then you have these really cool like fluid dynamics or, or cool explosions and stuff. So we're, we're always just trying to find a way to stay in the engine when we can. But understand to be flexible for when visual effects want this, wants this whole project, you know, later on down the line. You guys using... Um... So Maya as a main DCC, any, anyone mm. using Blender? We would use Blender for things that Maya just doesn't handle super well. Cause you know, Blender is open source, right? So there's some things, very niche specific things that it's like, oh, I think there's a plugin for Blender. Whereas it doesn't, nor doesn't really exist for Maya, but it's mostly Maya ZBrush. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, just in interesting to see how the, the tools are evolving and changing how some studios are now starting to adopt uh, things like unreal or blender or houdini for lighting where it was usually only vfx yeah yeah any, yeah. any other um kind of evolution moving away from the traditional vfx tools hmm moving away you know i don't we still use substance and we still use maya um but it's so interesting to see Unreal is like trying to incorporate this stuff in Unreal to make it like a one-stop shop kind of thing. In all my experience, like working with like things like once it's, it does everything, it's usually lacking in some capacity, right? It's not really good at like just one thing. Um, so I don't know if we're leaving things behind per se, we're still using these things. It's just that we try to find unique in creative ways to stay in the engine when we can. You guys using any USD? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, everyone, like some, some studios want to use USD, but I, I had worked with USD for a couple of years and we were trying to find a good way to get this back into Unreal. But as you probably know, you know, USD is great, but like if you're a studio that does a lot of things in Unreal, and I mean Niagara or particular like shader effect related things, or probably even now, like if you were to use the, the PCGs, the procedurally, whatever PGC stand, procedurally generated content, whatever that's, whatever it stands yeah, content for. Content generation, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, those things, USD doesn't know what that is. And yeah. if you were to bring that to any other software, it doesn't know how to like take an Unreal like very specific shader node and then convert that back into like something Arnold or Maya or Houdini understands. So it's tough. It's like it, and I've been watching, I mean, I've been passively watching USD updates come through all the time, but I have yet to see it really fulfill its duty. Now it's probably great outside of Unreal. Um, and maybe Unreal will get it one day, but as long as they keep making things that are very specific to Unreal and keep marketing people to like, you should use PCGs or, you know, that it's great. And it speeds up your workflow. It does all these amazing things. That just, that's just one extra thing that like a USD is going to have to try to understand to build back into it, to send it back out. Yeah. And that was the age old challenge of trying to have standards in 3d. Yeah. It's still a, yeah. a noble quest, but yeah. <laughs> noble um, quest indeed. 
<laughs> we'll, we'll keep we'll keep trying. Yeah. Um. So yeah, just really interested in in tools because I know they're they're evolving and the way that we're approaching creating things in general is evolving. We're, you're you're already describing something <laughs> that's a, a relatively new pursuit. You know, we weren't using Unreal that long ago to do this type of work. Um, mm -hmm. Even that's kind of new. <clears throat> something else that's new that's uh, that's starting. There's obviously a hot topic on everyone's minds and sometimes a bit of a polarizing topic to talk about but uh good old ai or machine learning or neural nets or whatever you want to call it um do you are you using this and you, and you don't have to like say what sony's doing necessarily but uh <laughs> do you what do you, what do you think about uh some of these new things that are appearing from the the generative to the things that are just supplementing the visual effects process things certain things are just helping like traditional things like mocap and paint and roto and those kinds of things mm -hmm. there you know when i was still an environment artist i would always like wish and think one of these days i'll never have to retopo ever again and i can't wait for something to come around where i hit a button and it just magically retopos my mesh because we were doing vr stuff back then when i was an environment artist and uh, retopo is part of the job and it kind of it's kind of boring when you got to retopo like a hundred things a week right so but yeah, now modeling, that we're modeling here, where you've like model mod, sculpt it model it retopo it uv it yeah <laughs> you've like modeling five times just for one i know week. dude yeah and so now that like we're actually here where well, there is stuff that like oh yeah you just like tell it to do a thing and it will like make that for you it's crazy and so like I, I think about it in terms of like what's happened in the past, you know, like I wonder how disruptive, cause like, I mean, I was around for it, but I was way too young. Like, what was it like when 3d came around and all these 2d artists were like, well, crap, like, what am I going to do now? Like, do I have to learn 3d? Like it's doing what I do even quicker. Sure. I'm still like doing things, but like it, they're not drawing every frame over and over and over like what they had to do you know for all these disney films and, and such so and what was it like you know when when we moved from film cameras to digital cameras how disruptive are these forces and so i often think about that with ai it's like you know i wonder if like we're in one of those ages that's very similar to 2d to 3d or film to digital and like i'm curious because we're at the start of it so it's hard to see like how disruptive it'll ultimately be um it's but funny, I often it's think funny you it. say that because uh, so, the way some people talk about it online, it sounds like we're kind of at the end of it. <laughs> it's all done that everyone's like now working in AI it's, and all the all the work's gone. Well, there's there's probably for sure like a lot of like smaller users using it, but the studios I feel like are going to be too nervous because of all the legal implications yeah. of uh, moral AI. I think the only one who's doing it like right is um, Adobe because Adobe is what they call it, Firefly. Is that what they call it? Um, yeah. they had Adobe has Adobe stock, which users sign an agreement and they put all their pictures on there. So whatever, I think, the, I think it's called Firefly. It pulls yeah. from stock and that's what it trains on. So that's cool, right? That, that they acquired those images in a, in a rightful good way. Um, so that's, that's interesting. Like, and I don't know of many others that are going about that. You'll certainly see lots of smaller filmmakers wanting to use things like Sora to quickly green light or, you know, for their pitch deck for their film. You know, like I wrote this script and I have this 30 second clip of what I kind of want it to be. Please give me money for my movie, right? So you'll probably see a lot of that, but I'm, I'm curious how the studios and larger productions will approach it. I don't know. Yeah, no, me neither. That's a good, a good answer. Yeah, yeah. Nobody, nobody does. A lot of people online talking confidently like they do know where it's going or where it is. But what what about the reality of today? You know, where, where, where do you where do you see it being useful right now? Well, it's definitely good. You know, earlier I talked about technological barriers stop people from doing things. And uh, this will sound off topic, but it's not off topic. But when TikTok came out, TikTok like took down the, the the technical requirement barrier of being like of like a filmmaker or an editor for like things 
and you can make videos so easily on TikTok. All, and it's crazy, right? And there's millions of us using TikTok and making videos all the time. And so um, today, I would imagine that you'll see the earliest phases have got to be like, hey, this is not going to be used for monetization in some way. So this is going to be used for like a proof of concept or a pitch deck or something like that until they can figure out the legalities behind it. Um, and I think that you'll always, my, my hope, my heart always tells me that we're going to have, when you think about like Christopher Nolan, Christopher Nolan, I don't believe would want to use uh, AI to make his movies, right? When you see a Christopher Nolan film pop up on a billboard in LA somewhere, you're like, oh, it's his new movie. I got to go see that. I love Christopher Nolan. And I don't think he's the kind of filmmaker, and many of them, I don't think many of them are the kind of filmmakers that would want to do that. Certainly, there will be more than not. It might even come back to the old argument of, of film versus digital, where people like uh, both of the Nolans, Christopher and Jonathan, and Quentin Tarantino, they're for film, and they do everything on film, and they'll never switch, right? Um but you have people like Roger Deakins, you know, they started out on film and then it came to digital. Now he shoots on Ari all the time and he can get a film look. Um, and I feel like it might come down to that eventually where you will have people who are like, I only go, I only watch pure human made films in the cinema and I don't watch the AI stuff, which like if you, Quentin Tarantino owns two movie theaters and they show his personal collection of films and they're all 35 millimeter. And I think he has some, 16 millimeter films in there. And that's really fun because someone like me, uh, I want to go find, I seek it. I seek to find theaters in LA that I can watch a film with the original film. So I, I'm taking like that, that experience and putting it in the future for like AI films versus like, like human made films. And I know that people are still like technically, I think they might even call themselves prompt engineers, which is such an interesting job title. Um, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But I feel like that it might just be another thing that like, I don't know how, I mean, I don't know how you can stop it. Uh, I don't know. It's going to keep going. I feel like I might not necessarily use it. Um, and I understand the appeal to use it and I understand even the financial side of using it. Right. I mean, not that I agree with it, but like from like a big corporate, you know, perspective, like, sure. I get that. I mean, I don't agree with it, but uh, I feel like it's just going to come whether we want it to or not. I wouldn't disagree with you on that for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Make friends with our robot overlords. <laughs> Terminator 2. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, the, the AI movie premiere, Terminator 2 uh, parody in LA tomorrow. Yeah, kind of a historic moment, I guess, one way mm -hmm. or the other. Um, so, can you tell us uh, about Westworld? What was it? What was that like? What was it like working? Westworld on it? was. What did you do? Westworld was cool. So I was on that project. I was the uh, the VAD lead, and VAD stands for Virtual Art Department, right? And you'll usually see them on every like virtual production project. You'll see you'll have like two phases. You'll have like before set and then you're on set, right? So before set, you're making all this stuff creatively. And then you'll have some of that bad team go on set to these virtual production shoots. And you'll they'll have to, sometimes it can still be creative where the director or the DP might ask, uh, you know, now that we have it in context of the wall, which is important, by the way, it's the same idea as if you're making a game for VR, you don't judge it by your monitor, you judge it by putting the headset on. Because ultimately, that's how it's going to be consumed or looked at. So in a volume, there's only so much you can do beforehand until you get there. So once you're there, you get a small VAD team. And I was a VAD lead for on Westworld. And we would get there, and we would still tweak it. We'd have pre-light days you know, with the, with the director of photography. And I'd work with director of photography, and we would figure out how do we marry this physical set's lighting with the digital set's lighting? And how do we get those to blend correctly so that through the lens of the camera, it's completely seamless and it looks like you're really there, right? 
So that's a lot of what the the bad team will help out when when they're on set for these kinds of things. It's the same thing on Westworld. Um, and it's a it's a Jonathan Nolan television show. So all of Westworld shot on film. So that's shot on film. Um, we shot it at Nant Studios. Dope. Great, great team over there. Uh, their volume completely encloses you, which I've only, I think that's the only volume I've been in personally that completely encloses you. And it has a ceiling. It's pretty dope. Um, and once you're, once you're there and like you're standing in your content and you're looking how the light falls off your hand, you know, you'll see people doing this a lot where like they're looking to see where the highlight of the light and how it falls off my knuckle or goes around my, how that wrap happened. See people walk in the volume and they're like, Oh, this is, this is so interesting. Like how it's doing this. And so a lot of it's blending and marrying that whole thing together. And you do that in tandem, which we talked about earlier, you know, this virtual world smashing into traditional filmmaking, right? This is smack dab in the middle of that. So figuring out how to blend these things together and then, you know, improve the image, is a lot of what that do when they're on set. And that's what a lot of what we did when we were on Westworld. So you're, as you described, doing a lot of work beforehand as much as you can to be able to visualize it off outside the volume, but then ultimately needing to go into the volume to make sure mm -hmm. that you're, you're looking at it through the right cameras and on the right screen and that it all adds up. How, how much work um, does it become um, how many surprises do you, you find in the volume that you just didn't see when you were off site? Oh, all the time. Like all the time. And and that's and that's fine. That's like expected. Um you can you can get as close as you can beforehand, right? So a lot of times they'll they'll send me out to do either set photography before we get there, or they'll send me out to like LIDAR scan the actual LED volume set so that we can plan as much as we can, right? Like if I have a LiDAR scan of a set, I can help the gaffer figure out where are his lights, where are they going to hang, you know, in the volume? Where's, where's like the blocking of the action going to happen within the volume and emulate? How does the light fall off from the wall in Unreal? Like, how does that replicate back to, you know, in real life? And there's only so far you can go before you actually need to get there. There's probably some math curve of like diminishing returns, you know, of like, nope, just stop and go straight to the volume because you're just wasting your time. Because um, that's that's what really, really matters. Get it as far as you can, plan as well as you can, but you need to absolutely schedule days. You know, if you're making a, if you're making a film in the virtual production, the LED volume, schedule days for pre-lights. They are so important. And if you, And if you don't have them, you're in for a rough time. You're in for a rough time. Yeah, makes sense. I know that yeah. the volume's expensive, so people always try and keep that to a minimum. But uh, mm -hmm. if they're renting it, but if it finds yeah. it important. Yeah, yeah. What's it been like? Uh, you know, rolling through the past year of all the craziness in the in the film industry. Well, you know, Torchlight was the kind of upset. Did that affect yeah, you? Yeah, guys? not Torchlight. Um, Torchlight because we work early on i mean sometimes before the movie's even been greenlit like it's usually just the directors that we're working with so um they solved their problems early on and all that and they got their contracts you know fixed up for all what they wanted um so we were able to work with directors and that's because that's the bulk of like what we're here for we're here to help visualize like much early on in the process um what this movie's going to look like in a similar fashion that like you know when you work in an led volume you're bringing all you're really doing in, in a virtual production pipeline. You're taking content that begins at the end, visual effects, that final looking quality, and you're putting it like in the middle or the beginning, right? So we're doing the same idea for filmmakers or for directors and filmmakers is early on in the process, what is this going to look like and uh, how are we going to inform your team, you know, what this is going to look like. So it didn't affect us too much. It didn't affect us too much. Oh, that's good. Glad to hear it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's been a bit of a wild time um and it's still resolving yeah. any any advice that you would give to anyone starting out you know, and being interested in this industry what advice would you give to somebody who's kind of new new to it hasn't got in yet um three things i always say these these three things um one is when i'm on when i'm on set and i'm i'm working with a whole crew of people 
I might not necessarily remember the person who is like the most incredibly talented, skillful person there, but I definitely remember all the hardest working people there, all the nicest people there, all the most collaborative people there, all the best like, you know, humans that I work with on set. I always remember them. And of course the skillful, talented people, sure. Like I'll connect with them and we'll chat and we'll do stuff, you know, but I always remember the, the most collaborative, nicest, hardest working people. Um, so one, like no ego, no pride, full humility. And that will take you so much further than a lot of people, a lot of people out there. It's just that part. Um, two, you know, I talked about technology and being creative as like a spectrum of like how technically gifted you are versus how creative you are. And I still like to say that if, if you're, if you lean more technical, right, you'll be very useful for a year until the new thing comes out. But if you are very creative, you'll always be useful. Even if we're talking about the subject of AI, you still need to know an art direct, like how to tell a good story or what looks you know good or pleasing to the eye, right? You still need to know how to do that. That's why I've, I've been agnostic to any lighting tool that I'm using, whether it's I'm on set with a gaffer or um, I'm in Unreal or I'm painting or whatever, like they're just tools, right? And so I rely now more on being creative because that will take me for my whole life. I'll be secure in that. Um, and uh, um, what was the third thing? The third thing, I don't remember the third thing. It will remain a mystery. And that will get me on part two of this in the future where I will reveal the third mystery. Um, but no, for real, Stay like tuned, it's everybody. being collaborative and a hard worker and really putting your nose down and studying like what you're doing. Um, and then being creative, you need to have technical skills because that's a world that we live in, right? You can't ultimately avoid it. Um, you gotta have it still, but don't completely rely on it because you're going to be chasing it just like I was. The, a new thing will come out and it will replace that thing. And you have to learn the new thing and learn another thing and then learn another thing. And me personally, I just didn't like it. So um, lean being creative, observe where you are, just take it in, like really look at, at what's around you and really study film. Or if it's games, like if you're into games, really study that. Or actually, there are something, if we're talking from a lighting perspective, I would study for sure paintings, classic paintings, um, and like some of the greatest cinematographers and photographers of our time. They're masters of lighting. And I'm always referring back to these filmmakers or photographers or classic pieces of art. I'm always referring back to them every time. I'm not usually going back and thinking, you know what? I think this filmmaker, when he made this movie about 12 years ago, I'd like to refer back to that for like what I want. I'm never doing like, unless it's like some Oscar winner or something, but there's only one Oscar winner a year. So really pick your sources. Um, really pick your sources for, for what you're pulling inspiration from. You don't want to be led down necessarily like the wrong way. You want to be going toward what all these masters of the art have been pursuing their whole life. Like the guys painting all that stuff, right? Those guys, they, they painted all day long. I got to go to work. I got a nine to five. I don't think they nine to five existed back then. So uh, they're, they put their whole life into it. So Study those just as, yeah, yeah, I could talk about this all day, dude. I know we're probably about to, to lock it down now, but. Uh, Bef before we do, is there anything that you'd like to share with anyone? Anyone, any uh, work you want to share or links or places people can follow you? Uh, so I'm on, uh, on this, on the show, do they like link out my socials? Uh, yeah, we can do. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, of course I'm on LinkedIn. Um, so I'm a cinematographer and lighting supervisor at Torchlight, right? So it's all about, for me personally, the future of filmmaking in this position is being 
a person who who is a cinematographer on set, but also knows how to do the stuff in Unreal, because that's what we're moving towards is this connected world together. And how do we do that? Right. And there's not a whole lot of people. But I think you guys just talked to a guy from New York yesterday. Um, I don't remember his name. I reached out to him, but he was a DP and a virtual production supervisor. So he is on the right track. And I think that's really awesome for him. Um, so I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram. I'm a photographer. So my Instagram handle is like Devin M underscore photography. I just came back. Oh, and I got an R station too. Forgot all about that. Thank you for posting that. And uh, I'm always doing something, whether it's unreal work or I'm filming something personally, you know, or taking pictures around LA or just around the country, around the world. Um, I'm always chasing, you know, the Devin in like five years. That's what I'm always chasing. It's like, what, how, what am I going to be in five years? I look forward to like seeing how far I'm going to get in five years and then another five years, like another five years, like what is that going to look like? So I'm always searching for it. I'm always trying to perfect it, which I guess is the artist's ultimate demise. You know, it's, there's no ceiling to it. It's just as far as you can go. And that's exciting to me. Oh, your enthusiasm is infectious and uh, <laughs> hopefully if not before uh, we'll have you back in five years to test that theory but uh, nice. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, out of your day I know you've got a lot going on I uh, appreciate you taking the time to share your wisdom and your knowledge and your enthusiasm with our viewers thank you uh, thanks for being here today thank you guys I really I really enjoyed it me too me too yeah and thanks for Thanks to all of our listeners as well. Thanks for being here. Thanks for participating and being in the chat. Um, we will be back again in another two weeks with episode 68, I guess. And uh, if you've enjoyed today, you can follow us at becomecgpro.com or in our free Facebook group. Um, on the school side, we also have an open day tonight. So if you want to come and join us and check out the school and see what we're all about and what we do in training people in Unreal Engine and virtual production and other things as well, games and whatnot, uh, come to our open day. Come check out what we're doing. And uh, it's free and you're, you're welcome to join us. Probably some links going out right now. But uh, again, Devin, thank you for being our guest today. Appreciate you. Thank you. And, uh, We'll see you all soon. Take care, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>